Sofía Steele. Sofía Steele. Fernando. Sofía Steele. Ay, sí, muy bien. Uh, and this one. No. No. We are. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so we need to sign. Oh. Absolutely. It is now live and ready for writing. These are a nice to use the pen? This is something I will use. In fact, I'm already using it. Mm -hmm. See? <laughs> you could be using it now. I think we're all, we're all good. We're all signed. <laughs> signed, sealed, and delivered. minutes and we'll be holding <laughs> off cars to show the time so if, if we're running long Impressive. Yeah, a big hook will come out no. <laughs> Okay, uh, so welcome everyone and the major session of the uh, behavior addiction track of this conference called uh, uh, <coughs> the convergence in behavior addictions and uh, so just to start this uh, session now and I would like to welcome all of you and also I would like to express my uh, thanks to the organizers to having this possibility uh, to be part of this conference for the second time this year and also uh, contribute to the conference as in this, with this major session is also tomorrow at 6 p.m. there will be a big debate which is also 
closely related to the issues which we will discuss here uh, today. And thanks to all of you also for being here. I would just like to give a very brief few minute uh, introduction and then I will give the microphone to my colleagues who will uh, provide uh, four talks and then we will have time for uh, discussion as well. Um, just really very shortly, if we, if we set this question that about the convergence in uh, behavior addictions or let's say among the different behavior addictions, but also that could be a question, a convergence between non-substance related and substance related uh, addictive disorders, then we should look a little bit back in time, not very fast. So I mean, it's just not very long time ago, let's say it's 15 years, when we talked about addictions, that, was, that it was almost equal to talking about substance-related issues. We talked about dependence and abuse, not disorders that time, not uh, exclusively, but that uh, was about substance-related issues. And non-substance-related addictive disorders were uh, either considered as impulse control disorder or related to some compulsive uh, disorder or, or not even discussed or classified in the different diagnostic uh, uh, systems. And also we can say that uh, in those times, again, not very, very, very long time ago, uh, apart from gambling research, not much has been done, not much was going on. Uh, there were some studies, but not very extensively. And also, I mean, I can remember that you can get, you can, you, you could get easily rejected by any addiction journal just being out of scope if you submitted something on internet related issues or video game related issues. Again, just thinking back like 15 years ago. Um, that, and, and also if we look back to the handbooks published in those times, they usually dealt with exclusively substance related issues. Maybe gambling was mentioned, but not uh, many other ideas. What has happened since then? Or what has changed uh, during these times? Well, we can remember in the mid or the late 90s about the first reports on internet addiction. And then uh, besides the increasing uh, research activity on uh, gambling, what we have witnessed is, an, is, a, is a really extensive and a very uh, substantial uh, change in the technolo technological development, which led to the use of the smartphone, social media, online pornography appeared, online shopping, online gambling, online video games. And we have to be aware that all these technological changes boosted very much our interest. We have witnessed an increasing treatment demand related to these issues, and we have experienced a lot of problems which uh, led the researchers to focus on these areas as well. And we have also experienced a convergence specifically between video game user gaming and gambling, which is especially an interesting area, but also many other uh, convergences were uh, experienced uh, in the past few years or one or two uh, decades. And how did it influence uh, the scientific field. So what we could see that, uh, that we have really witnessed a significantly increased research activity, which is focusing on the assessment of these issues, the diagnostics, but also the different etiological factors, negative consequences, neuroscience and genetics, uh, genetical studies, as well as uh, clinical uh, studies. We have witnessed the change uh, in the diagnostic systems as uh, gambling, gambling disorder was moved into uh, the behavioral or the, into the addiction uh, group uh, in the fifth revision and in ICD, the same has happened with an additional change that gaming disorder, this problematic video game use was also included as a new disorder. New handbooks already, that's what we see, that often discuss other, other 
uh, addictive disorders, which are not related to substance use as well. And there are also a uh, lot has happened regarding the new handbooks, new journals uh, had been started, like the journal Behavior Addictions, but also others, and uh, also uh, many uh, new research groups, research centers, has started to focus on behavioral addictions. The annual organized the International Conference of Behavior Addictions, which I also would like to advertise a little bit, so if you go out of the room later, then you will see a sorry, table with some advertisement regarding the conference, which will be held next year in Incheon, Korea, uh, in uh, August. And as I said, many uh, research centers has also started to focus on uh, these areas. So what we thought to discuss here today is a little bit go into a bit more deeper into these changes and look at the psychological and neurobiological data and also the treat treatment aspect and policy aspects of this convergence uh, in the area. So we will have uh, four talks in the uh, followings and a discussion, and then at the end, we will open the floor for uh, questions and, and further discussion. As I mentioned, a, there are uh, uh, more and more research groups, and that also means that uh, compared to the former times when often just uh, lonely or single researchers uh, worked on the field, now it's more and more research groups, and the first uh, First, uh, or one evidence to show is, show this one that unfortunately, Matthias Brand, professor, could not attend today because of uh, some health issues, but it was quite easy to replace him with uh, Professor Silke Muller from uh, his group. So, so that also means that uh, in the field, we are, uh, there are many, many good researchers and, and uh, now, uh, I will ask Silke to present her talk on the convergence in psychology of behavior addictions from uh, University of Duisburg, Essen. So thank you very much for being here and Silke, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Joel, for the kind introduction. And um, my name is Silke Müller, and I'm presenting here on behalf of Matthias Brandt, as Joel already said. And um, yeah, that's a great pleasure and an honor for me here today to um, tell you something about convergences in the psychology of marital addictions. Um, yeah, Matthias is very sad that he could not be here because he lost this conference, and um, I already know why. So, um, but I'm sure he will be here on the next um, Lisbon Addictions. So, yeah, um, I will present something about convergences in the psychology of behavioral addictions, uh, and I'm happy to do this in front of this great audience and in this uh, very nice symposium. As an introduction, as you probably all know, um, there are um, the gaming disorder and gambling disorder are included in the ICD-11 in the category of disorders due to addictive behaviors. And they both share some um, clinical diagnostic criteria. So for gaming disorder, these are, um, which are very similar for gambling disorder, these criteria are diminished control over the behavior, then increasing priority given to the behavior and a continuation or escalation of the behavior despite the occurrence of negative consequences. And the ICD also um, mentions another um, yeah, essential overarching criterion, which is that the behavior results in um, significant functional impairment and or marked distress in uh, daily life. And these um, essential criteria are um, or there are additional clinical features mentioned in the ICD-11. Um, for example, unsuccessful efforts to reduce gaming behavior, 
or cravings or mood modification. And um, yeah, all these clinical features tap into different psychological processes um, which represent different kinds of convergences across behavioral addictions. And there is another category, um, so-called um, residual category of um, other specified disorders due to addictive behaviors. And um, some colleagues have recently suggested that um, buying shopping disorder, pornography use disorder, and maybe also social networks use disorder are possible candidates for this special, um, yeah, this special category in the ICD-11. And um, I will now present some theoretical um, considerations and empirical evidence showing um, convergencies across these different kinds of addictive behaviors. So coming to theory, um, not very surprising that Matthias put one of these uh, charts here today. So this is uh, one of the theoretical models that has been used by some researchers in the past year. Uh, it's, or in the past years, it's called the IPACE model, so the interaction of person, affect, cognition, execution model. And um, given time constraints, I will not go into detail to all these boxes and um, arrows, but I will show or summarize the main um, yeah, core elements of this model. And the model suggests that there are some vulnerability factors or predisposing variables, for example, psychopathology or um, personality characteristics um, yeah, that have an influence or may um, yeah, predispose towards a specific addictive behavior. But more importantly, there's, it's assumed that these based or based on these um, predisposing variables, they're in interaction between the person and the environment. So for example, when using online games or when using social networks, um, there are affective and cognitive mechanisms that change over time. So um, it is assumed that this change then results in specific symptoms of um, behavioral addiction. The most typical effective processes uh, seems to be cure activity and craving, for example, that develop over time, and also um, reductions in hin inhibitory control. And um, there are different meta-analyses showing that there are different types of behavioral addictions, um, and there are reliable findings. Here is an example of um, gaming disorder, and the findings are relatively uh, reliable on that there are so-called risk factors for developing a behavioral addiction. And these risk factors include uh, psychopathological characteristics, so um, particularly depression, anxiety, or social anxiety, uh, and symptoms of ADHD. And there are some personality traits which are defined as uh, risk factors, particularly impulsivity. And um, there are also dysfunctions in emotion regulation. And there is only one uh, protective factor, which is uh, having good self-control. Coming to affective processes, there um, is convincing evidence from both psychological and neuroimaging studies emphasizing the involvement of cure activity and craving, especially in gaming and gambling disorders. And these um, do not only show the involvement of cure activity and craving, but also show that there might be a shift from more reward-oriented cravings to um, more relief-oriented or compulsion-related cravings in the respective neural mechanisms. Um, I will not go into detail into the uh, neural mechanisms because um, Marco Tensa will hold the next talk and then tell more about the neurobiology. 
but um, yeah, it is assumed on the psychological level that there might be a shift from more reward-oriented to relief-oriented craving. And this also seems to be the case, for example, for buying shopping disorder. So um, in this study from 2021 by Trotzke and colleagues, um, they showed, for example, that patients with buying shopping disorder showed higher subjective cravings than uh, compared to the control group. And on the brain level, they showed that there are uh, correlations between the activity in the ventilus striatum with the symptom severity. And this correlation was only uh, significant in the um, patient group and not in the control group. And what they also showed is that there is an activity in the dorsal striatum um, in the patients compared to the control groups. So um, altogether, these results demonstrate that there are um, craving and cure activity are important aspects in buying shopping disorder. And so this emphasizes that these are um, yeah, fundamental psychological convergences. And um, also that there is a shift from reward-oriented to relief-oriented craving is something we see across different kinds of behavioral addictions. And there is also some evidence for the involvement of reduced inhibitory control and other ex executive functions in gaming and gambling disorders. Um, but also there are meta-analyses showing that there is, uh, these are reduced in unspecified internet use disorders. And this also fits to results from a, a recent meta-analysis that demonstrates the changes um, in prefrontal cortex areas in unspecified internet use disorders. And all these results also um, yeah, converge to the view that reduced self-control uh, seems to be a main psychological correlate of behavioral addictions and also shows the convergence across different kinds of addiction. So in conclusion, um, there are convergences of behavioral addictions. And um, as Matthias has expressed in his recent publication in Science, there may be two driving paths towards addictive behaviors. And the first is reward-oriented, and it's called the feels better path. It's uh, the one in red here on the figure. And um, the feels better also includes a less bad and represents cravings on the basis of positive as well as negative reinforcement. And likely later in the addiction process, it is assumed that there is a second driving path, and this is more um, that the behavior develops to more habits and compulsions, and this is called the must-do path. This is the one in blue on the figure. And, um, yeah, that's a term uh, already used by Trevor Robbins. And um, the counterpart to these two driving paths is assumed um, to be yeah, the self-control within the prefrontal cortex, the so-called stop now process. And in terms of convergence of the psychology of behavioral addictions, um, it is proposed that there is an imbalance between these two driving paths and self-control, and that these develop um, over time and then result in uh, the manifestation of the behavioral addiction. But of course, there are also some challenges for the future. So, um, for example, there's these so-called uh, vulnerability factors. They are not very specific, and um, yeah, as they are also involved in other mental disorders, and um, they also co occur as comorbid um, conditions of other behavioral addictions, uh, as for example, depression. And another challenge is that um, the causality is not very clear. So for example, um, regarding self-control, it could be that reduced self-control is a risk factor for developing a behavioral addiction but also during the addiction process, it might be that 
self-control is decreased further. So um, yeah, like a cascade model. And third, the um, specificity is um, also something that has to be looked at more systematically in the future. Um, the specificity of which applications are used and how they influence the development um, of the specific behavior. Yeah, there's also, there are other interesting topics um, like, for example, to investigate impulsivity and compulsivity as trans diagnostic processes, but I will skip this for now and come to another point. Um, in terms of convergence, there are also convergences within the applications that are used addictively. So um, you may have heard of loot boxes, um, which are gambling elements within video games. So this is an example of how um, yeah, these different kinds of, of elements may increase the addictive potential of applications um, because they converge more and more. And another example is um, social networks use, which or social networks which are used for online shopping purposes, for example. So, um, as Astrid Müller has pointed out recently, there might be an overlap between these two behavioral addictions. So, between social networks use disorder and buying shopping disorder, because there are more and more elements that overlap like for example, influencers who um, promote products on Instagram. And there is a current research project in Germany um, where we, um, yeah, we are in a larger consortium and um, where we investigate and see that individuals that show buying shopping disorder are likely to also have problematic social networks use. So this um, is something that we have to investigate more in the future, and these convergences need to be better understood. Uh, yeah, and this is one of the future challenges. So with that, um, I thank on behalf of Matthias, uh, his team, which are my colleagues, um, and they are wonderful, nice, talented people uh, who is, uh, is a pleasure to work with. And I thank Matthias for sending me a few notes. Um, and I also thank the DFG, the German Research Foundation, for funding our research. And finally, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zilkan. As I suggested, I would save the time for questions at the end and, and not at each of the uh, presentations. So thank, thanks again, especially for popping in on such a short notice uh, because of Matthias' absence. And I would like to call to the floor uh, Professor Mark uh, Potenza, who is uh, uh, director of uh, the Division of uh, Addiction Research at the Yale uh, School of Medicine, and uh, I guess many of you knows Mark. He's probably one of the most influential researchers of the field. Uh, so thanks very much for your talk in advance. And floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you for the kind words, and thank you for the organizers for um, hosting this wonderful uh, panel. So I'll be uh, continuing the uh, symposium talking about neurobiological convergences. I have a listing of disclosures with respect to gaming, gambling, uh, legal, and pharmaceutical entities. And I'll um, look at some things that I think Jolt and Zilke um, have uh, said um, and put them into perhaps from a slightly different perspective but in a way that resonates. So thinking about how the term addiction has changed historically, uh, in its initial usage it wasn't linked to substance use disorders. Going back about 400 years or so ago, it became linked to substance use disorders such that by the 1980s, the expert work groups, uh, such as for uh, DSM-3-TR, thought that addiction could be defined by compulsive drug use. However, going back to the 1990s, people began to challenge this notion and to think about some of the core elements of addiction, 
that we heard about in the uh, prior presentations, where people experience cravings or urge states um, over which they had diminished control uh, and that they continued in a behavior despite the adverse consequences leading to compulsive engagement. And if we think about these as the core elements of addiction, they could be um, applied to a broader range of behaviors. And um, Constance Holden in the journal Science in the first decade of this millennium had a couple of articles where I think it, it noted a swinging of the pendulum um, such that in the first uh, article in 2001, she asked whether behavioral addictions existed and whether we could use new technologies like brain imaging to understand some of the ways in which gambling and substance use disorders, for example, shared similarities. And then in 2010, she had an article, Behavioral Addictions, debut and proposed DSM-5, which heralded the reclassification that uh, Jolt mentioned um, in DSM-5. Um, and I was involved in two of the DSM-5 research work groups to understand or uh, to gather the, the data that existed at the time to think about whether there were similarities between gambling and substance use disorders uh, and gambling and impulse control disorders, um, uh, particularly obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders, um, to think about what is going to be the best classification. And based upon this, uh, pathological gambling, uh, now gambling disorder, was reclassified um, based on the, the large amount of data that had been acquired over time. Uh, at the time, there were less data on a wider range of behaviors uh, involving the internet and uh, other uh, non-internet-based uh, behaviors. But um, for the DSM-5, uh, there were a number of different domains that were uh, considered. And for today's talk, I'm going to focus on uh, neurobiology, but also think about how this relates to treatment, as um, I'm a clinician by uh, training and think that this is an important element of understanding the uh, neurobiology. So one of the, the core features, one of the psychological constructs uh, that is complex um, is decision making. And it involves a number of different processes that we uh, heard about with respect to reward processing, impulse control, and other uh, factors. But if we go back to the 1990s, people like Antoine Bashara um, implicated the um, ventral medial prefrontal cortex as being very relevant uh, to uh, a broad range of decision making. Um, some of which uh, may be influenced by the ways in which people uh, discount rewards. Uh, so a more rapid temporal discounting of rewards has been implicated in multiple forms of addictive behaviors, um, as well as its treatment that, for example, we've uh, looked at with respect to adolescent smokers. And uh, going back now several decades, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex has been implicated in gambling and substance use disorders with um, uh, Tanabe and colleagues uh, finding that uh, performance on the Iowa gambling task was linked to blunted activation of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex um, in people with gambling and substance use disorders. Uh, but it cuts across a range of processes, including um, the outcome phase of reward processing uh, in people with gambling disorder. However, um, some of the more consistent findings that have been uh, obtained uh, across a variety of addictive disorders, including substance and behavioral addictions, arguably come from the anticipation phase, the anticipatory phase of monetary reward processing as assessed by the um, monetary incentive delay task. Um, and uh, interestingly, this blunted um, activation of the ventral striatum is also linked to some of the uh, constructs like impulsivity, suggesting that reward processing and impulse control are uh, linked. Uh, some of the, the data um, demonstrating uh, relatively blunted um, activation of the ventral striatum during reward anticipation, we reported on this uh, about a decade ago, and this blunted activation of the ventral striatum seems to cut across a variety of different tasks for people with gambling disorder. Um, more recently, now five years ago, uh, a meta-analysis um, indicated that 
um, across addictive disorders involving substance use and uh, gambling disorders uh, that there was this blunted ventral striatal um, activation during the um, anticipatory phase of monetary reward processing. And we integrated this task into randomized clinical trials of people with substance use disorders. And what we found was that um, here in people with cocaine use disorder and across the top panel is that after treatment, um, there was a, a more active uh, ventral striatal response to monetary reward processing, um, suggesting that um, a reward deficiency that exists in people with substance use disorders um, may be uh, countered through effective treatment such that um, there is a, a more uh, robust response to non-addiction related rewards. Uh, we also saw this in adolescents who were seeking to uh, quit smoking. And so those are substance use disorders. Um, and, and during the time of DSM-5, during the phase leading up to the release, um, it, there were multiple controversial um, aspects, um, including um, here indicated in these um, images from a Time uh, Magazine article uh, where they asked what was the new abnormal, uh, binge eating disorder, internet addiction, sex addiction. Uh, so these were all um, constructs that could be considered within an addiction framework. So I'll talk about binge eating first. Um, going back to that time, the question existed whether food addiction existed. Um, and Zia Udin and colleagues um, said that it really wasn't very convincing, uh, the data. We said it's premature to consider dismissing the idea. And they wrote back uh, that really, uh, why should we look at this question? Um, so the, during this time um, leading up to the DSM, there was this controversy going on with respect to food addiction. And we thought that of the DSM disorders that, were, that existed for eating disorders, um, binge eating disorder, which um, going from DSM-4 to DSM-5, moved from the research to the clinical sections, we thought binge eating disorder shared the most similarities with uh, food addiction. There were differences as well that we described in this paper. But in terms of this monetary incentive delay task uh, performance, we also saw that individuals with binge eating disorder showed relatively blunted activation of the ventral striatum during uh, monetary reward processing. And furthermore, there was individual variability that linked to treatment outcomes. So the people who had the more severe blunting continued to persist with binging after treatment. Um, but binge eating disorder wasn't the only uh, disorder that was uh, considered uh, controversial. Internet addiction was uh, another. And this, uh, I think, as the uh, prior presenters have um, made clear, the internet is used um, more by people now than in the uh, past, such that um, there have been national TV uh, specials like this Diane Sawyer uh, episode where uh, she asked questions whether screen media activity could be considered addictions, compulsions, or disorders. Um, so we heard a bit in the prior presentation about um, thinking about internet use disorder uh, as one construct, but there are also, um, we heard about the specificities and understanding the specificities as being important. And going back to the DSM-5 time, uh, gaming uh, was felt to be the uh, behavior for which there were the most data um, to um, indicate the basis for disorder. Um, so the DSM-5 included in the research criteria section um, criteria for internet uh, gaming uh, disorder. Um, but the ICD-11 was also um, being um, developed at this time. Um, and uh, I and others here on the panel were fortunate to be involved in multiple uh, World Health Organization related work groups that considered internet use behaviors and behavioral addictions. And when the time came for the World Health Assembly to adopt uh, the 11th revision of the International Classification of Diseases, uh, gambling and gaming disorders were included as disorders due to addictive behaviors. And I think also importantly from prevention perspectives, hazardous gambling and hazardous gaming were also 
included. And so this is akin to having a, an entity for hazardous alcohol use. Um, so it brings together um, gambling and gaming within this uh, addiction framework. Uh, and so there were data from a clinical perspective that suggested that um, gaming behaviors uh, might be uh, harmful here uh, with um, a patient dying uh, while a care provider was playing video games. From a neurobiological perspective, some of the, um, the findings of this blunted reward processing that applied to uh, gambling and substance use disorders also appears to apply to uh, problematic internet use here shown via EEG um, in uh, adolescents. But also from a, a neuroimaging perspective, um, like with uh, gambling and substance use disorders, this blunted activation of the ventral striatum um, has been reported in individuals with internet gaming disorder, as has um, uh, decreased functional coherence of an executive control network um, in individuals with internet gaming disorder that has been linked to uh, cognitive control measures. So again, this idea that uh, Zoka uh, was proposing about this control aspect um, uh, over the um, motivational drives appears to be relevant at a neurobiological level to internet gaming disorder. Uh, similarly, on a meta-analysis of um, uh, gray matter findings, volumetric findings in individuals with internet gaming disorder, uh, there are smaller uh, cortical gray matter volumes in uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex in regions that have been implicated in uh, drug addictions as indicated by uh, the NIDA slide here. So based on these um, and other findings, we proposed a model by which uh, there were different um, psychological domains that could be targeted with specific treatments to set up a framework. Uh, but we heard a bit about the uh, convergence of uh, gaming and gambling in the uh, prior talks. I would also argue, like in the prior talks, that there is a convergence with other forms of internet use, in this case, uh, gaming and pornography use. Uh, when the Fortnite server crashed, uh, Pornhub reported increases of uh, the proportion of individuals on um, uh, their website uh, increasing by 10% in searches for Fortnite-related pornography going up by 60%. So there are questions that have been um, raised about whether compulsive sexual behavior should be considered as addictions. This has been debated in the uh, literature, and we and others have put forward the notion that uh, the data suggests that um, it may be better uh, suited as a behavioral addiction than an impulse control disorder. So what are some of those data? Some of those data come from uh, brain imaging studies that show um, increased um, uh, reward-related responses to erotic cues uh, that link to uh, behavioral measures of sexual impulsivity as well as behavioral measures on the fMRI task. And then uh, some of the data from uh, Valerie Voon's uh, group suggests that some of the brain regions that are activated more so in men with compulsive sexual behaviors are, are those that are implicated in craving studies in uh, substance addictions, including the anterior cingulate, ventral striatum, and amygdala, and functional connectivity between these regions is linked to sexual desire in a greater uh, fashion than in the men uh, without the compulsive sexual behaviors. There are also attentional uh, predispositions to sexual cues uh, that exist in compulsive sexual behavior disorder that are similar to those um, in uh, substance addiction. And from a clinical perspective, um, there are um, impairments in multiple domains of uh, functioning uh, as well as uh, it links to psychopathology, poor self-esteem, and poor attachment that exists with problematic pornography use, which is often seen as a presenting clinical problem for people with hypersexual behaviors. 
We've also found in a community sample of men who view pornography that uh, problematic that one in seven was interested in uh, seeking treatment for their use of pornography, um, and that the those who were interested in seeking treatment viewed more pornography and exhibited greater hypersexuality. So some of the um, interventions that um, have support. Uh, for uh, problematic pornography, for uh, substance use disorders, appear to have preliminary support for problematic pornography use. So for the sake of time, I'm going to move through to the uh, conclusions and say that um, there are uh, data that link uh, gambling, gaming, uh, and substance use disorders together, uh, as well as for a broader range of behavioral addictions. Um, and I'd like to thank a large number of individuals, uh, funding agencies, the organizers, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And I would like to invite uh, our next uh, presenter, who is uh, uh, Susanna Jimenez. Uh, Musa and Susanna is director of the Pathological Gambling and Behavioral Addiction Unit at the University of Hospital Bad Belt Region, also affiliated with the University of Barcelona. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Professor Donatrovics, for inviting me to be here and to participate in this panel. And of course, thank you all for your interest and your attention. So uh, I'm going to talking about treatment of behavioral addictions. Uh, I do not have any commercial relationship to disclose. And here you can see the Belvice University Hospital where our behavioral addictions unit is located. Um, I'm going to talk about some epidemiological data about the patients who request treatment in our unit, more specifically uh, with gambling disorder and compulsive buying. Then I'll, I will continue with transdiagnostic and treatment approach of the behavioral addictions. And finally, I would like to show you some uh, studies about this perspective, tran transdiagnostic perspective in the treatment uh, um, outcome of uh, mm, compulsive buying and gambling disorder. Lifetime prevalence of gambling disorder in Spain, in Spain is 0.9%, uh, but up uh, to 4.4% of the population has risky behaviors. In the bar, uh, bar chart, you can see the number of new referrals per year to our unit since 2005 to March 2022, which the average stands at around 350 new cases per year. So in our database, now we have more than 5,100 patients with all the clinical uh, information registered. But uh, the majority of our patients seek treatment because of gambling disorder, as you can see, 88.2%. And here you can see the sociodemographic profile of our patients. The majority are male, uh, married with primary education, employed, and with a low socioeconomic uh, level. Uh, in terms of age, chronolo chronological age, the average, the mean age is uh, 42 years, age of onset 30 years, and the mean duration of the disorder, six years. And here you can see the data about compulsive buying. Now in our database, we have 212 patients with this disorder. And you can see the evolution over the years as well um, since 2005, in this case uh, to 2021. And in spite of some oscillations, the uh, rate is between 5% and 6%, and we have more women than men. Than men. Uh, here you can see the sociodemographic profile, women, single or married, primary or secondary education, unemployed, and again with a low socioeconomic level. And in terms of age, uh, the chronological age is 44, 34 as age of onset, and the duration of the disorder, seven years. And here you can see 
um, yeah, the frequency of these variables. So, uh, looking forward uh, from the transdiagnostic perspective and considering um, the dimensional uh, diagnostic classification, we can find, uh, and more, specific, more specifically, impulsive compulsive spectrum, we can find, you, we can identify uh, s several disorders which are sharing some common risk factors, such as high levels of compulsivity, high levels of impulsivity, and also deficits in uh, emotional regulation. So, in the compulsivity poll, we can find OCD, body dysmorphic disorder, restrictive anorexia nervosa, and as we move to, uh, toward uh, the impulsive poll, we can find uh, kleptomania, compulsive buying, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, ADHD, gambling disorder, and substance use disorders. But also, uh, we can consider this, uh, this model, transdiagnostic model, uh, but uh, regarding uh, in relation to treatment. So, uh, several authors pointed out that CBT might be implemented in a transdiagnostic way based on common characteristics in addictive disorders such as urgency, compulsivity, impulsivity, um, uh, deficits in social support and uh, self-control. And this would imply the design of new treatment protocols not focus on a specific disorders, but rather integrative or protocols valid for sets of disorders. And they have or can have uh, some benefits, such as uh, we can treat primary and secondary addictions at the same time, mitigating the potential risk of poor treatment outcomes and addiction crossover. And also we can reduce the number of treatments for comorbid addictions, that means more cost-effective interventions. One of these uh, models uh, is uh, the component model of addiction treatment, CMAT, designed by Kim and Hodgins in 2018. And it proposes that all addictions, whether they are substance or behavioral, share similar risk and maintenance factors. So uh, here you can see our treatment protocol for behavioral addictions. Um, we have two initial assessment sessions uh, in order to collect all, all clinical information uh, and uh, to apply or to perform a comprehensive battery of tests to identify uh, risk factors and to confirm the diagnostic. And then 16 weekly sessions lasting 90 uh, minutes each. And you can see also the techniques we are using, psychoeducation, stimulus control, uh, cognitive restructuring, problem solving, pre relapse prevention, and then we have um, two years follow-up. And we highly recommend the involvement, involvement or, uh, of a, a friend or a family member of the partner because uh, it's a, a component, un, one element uh, in the uh, recovery of the patient. It's a, an important uh, aspect. And now I would like to show you some studies conducted in our unit. In the first study, we explore uh, the motherhood and treatment outcome in female patients, in this case with compulsive uh, buying. Uh, it is known that motherhood uh, could be a facilitating factor in the recovery process uh, in, from, in mental disorders. So in this study, we explore 77 women, um, of them, uh, 49 of them uh, were uh, mothers. And when we compare both groups, mothers and non-mothers, we obtain non-statistical significant differences in the pathological state at the baseline, but we observe a statistical significant differences in money spent per, per compulsive buying episode and in the use of substances. In both cases, mothers uh, show less money spent and less um, uh, substance consumption. And when we compare treatment outcome, 
we uh, observed a slightly lower uh, rate of dropout for mothers, but without uh, let's say a statistical significant or differences. But uh, we obtain also lower risk of relapses among mothers, and also the rate uh, for the, the relapses was lower for mothers. In this other study, we wanted to explore treatment outcome in women with gambling disorder. We included 214 uh, women with this disorder, and we observed that 20% of dropouts uh, appeared during the first month and all dropouts during the first two months. The risk of dropout was 42% and the risk of relapse 36% and younger age, unemployed state, lower socioeconomic position, less severity of gambling disorder, and worse psychopathological state were associated to uh, dropout. Regarding relapse, lower educational levels, lower socioeconomic position, non-strategic gambling preference, um, no debts associated to gambling behavior, uh, higher beds um, per gambling episode, and uh, substance consumption were related to relapse. In this other study, we wanted to um, identify the existence of different subtypes, different clusters of patients with gambling disorder, and in, uh, or no patient, women, specifically women. And the, uh, in this case, we included 163 uh, patients. The most relevant variables in order to establish the different groups were the number uh, of sessions attended, and the dropout rates. And finally, we um, identify three different clusters, three different groups. Cluster one showed good recovery, and also uh, patients included in this cluster um, presented the healthiest uh, psychological profile. Then cluster two showed bad progression to dropout, and cluster three, bad progression to relapse. In cluster two, we um, uh, obtained that uh, they presented the um, lowest severity of gambling disorder, and in cluster three, we observed the highest severity of the disorder and also the more dysfunctional profile in terms of psychopathology, but also in terms of personality. In this other study, and entirely from a um, transdiagnostic perspective, we wanted to explore the existence of latent classes uh, for women with gambling disorder and compulsive buying. We obtained four latent classes. classes. Uh, latent class one showed good progression to recovery. Latent uh, uh, class two, uh, moderate middle progression. Latent class three, bad progression to dropout and for bad progression to relapse. In the, ca in the case of latent uh, class two, um, these patients show problems, uh, socioeconomic problems, and also social problems related uh, with um, the disorder. And in latent classes four, we obtain, we observe that the patients were younger and with um, younger, youngest age of onset and also uh, the more dysfunctional profiles, psychological profiles. And here you can see the survival analysis. And to conclude, uh, can be serious games or can serious games be um, effective, useful? for behavioral addictions. I would like to show you two studies, two projects conducted in our hospital using serious game. This is the first one. Um, we develop a serious game called Play Monster. It integrates five biosensors and also a camera uh, which register emotional state by means of uh, facial expression. And then now we have this other uh, serious game, it is uh, an app-based serious game 
uh, which integrates only one biosensor which registers heart rate and heart rate variability, and both uh, serious games are oriented to train patients to uh, improve self-control capacity and also um, emotional regulation uh, abilities. So this is my last slide. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna. And our fourth talk is de dedicated to uh, policy issues and will be delivered by Sophia Akap. Uh, dire director of uh, the Treatment Center Reconnect at the University Hospital of Geneva. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, for the invitation. Thank you to organizers. We're very happy to be here to tell you some words, share with you some thoughts about uh, convergence and divergence in addictive behaviors with substance use disorders from a policy uh, perspective. So first of all, it's a long journey, a journey uh, since uh, decades with very brilliant and very nice people doing a lot of work behind the scenes to uh, have these issues uh, integrated in, uh, the, uh, in policies and in standardization and in helping the field to get a clearer picture to act. So, one, my, one period that I want to talk about is the uh, period previous to the decision to include uh, in the ICD-11 of gaming disorder as a mental health disorder, an addictive disorder. So we were uh, facing, as Marc said, during some years, demons coming from individuals and their families Demands coming from care for professionals and uh, as well from social workers. So what to do with these demands? So basically, there were heterogeneous responses from the jurisdictions and from the health systems all over the world. Why this uh, heterogeneity? So we looked at this uh, issue, reviewing uh, cross-culturally what were the representations underlying the uh, epidemiological studies conducted globally. And what we identified is that depending on the uh, continents and the uh, cultures, a, uh, a lot of interest was de devoted to internet-related disorders from different uh, 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 underlying concepts, from compulse, uh, uh, impulse control disorders, from addictive disorders perspective, and uh, as well from a uh, pathological, dysfunctional, problematic uh, way of naming the issue. So this led to a disparity of uh, uh, screeners used, disparity in samples, biases as well in terms of age, with most of these conducted studies delivering data for policy making, uh, uh, um, uh, policy making, uh, purposeful policy making, was very hard to have with uh, mis mis miscellaneous underlying theoretical construct. So results were not epidemiological data, were not generalizable, cross-comparable, supporting efficient public health decision making, nor providing landmarks for medical decision making. This has been a uh, a result of the organizational models in the different jurisdictions and the continents, because the conversions, for example, between substance use disorders and addictive behaviors played a role. Whether in the health system you consider that the issue under the angle of an addictive disorder or under the angle of uh, OCD, for example. And all across the, the countries and the continents, there were a disparity in considering these disorders from these different perspectives. So the uh, response, treatment response to those individuals asking for help was defined by these health system infrastructure, uh, whether uh, from mental health services or from addictive, uh, addiction medicine services or from uh, pediatric uh, services, for example. And this was the case as well in other continents, even with less internet penetrance, such as uh, Europe and America. 
same in Middle East and in Australia, even in some countries, for example, questioning, still debating, decade after the first needs coming from individuals, still debating in whether it exists or not, or, and whether should we act on it or not. Economics played a major role as well in the uh, treatment response to these disorders. Basically, for money is, is uh, very much needed to build the treatment responses, but as well about the competing interests that could face uh, these uh, policy making towards considering some addictive behaviors as addictive disorders. Some examples from my country, for example, Switzerland, when we have lead in the way since uh, 2000, when civil society has called the, uh, the, uh, uh, the federal uh, council for, to act on the uh, dangers, the risks, harms that could uh, derive from tech use disorders, especially for children and adolescents. And in Switzerland since then, we had two major tracks in policy making, one under the health perspective and the other one under the educational perspective, still acting and developing national strategic plans. We ended in uh, 2016 in thinking about our national strategic plan for addictions in Switzerland based on a, an integrative approach integrating addictive behaviors with addictive disorders. We moved from a way of seeing the uh, addictive disorders from substance and national plan for each substance to towards a comprehensive integrative national plan towards addictions in general and including as well addictive behaviors as you can see here in the National Strategic Plan extracts. In terms of treatment response as well, we were leading the way since 2006, 2007 with a special, for example, a, a, a treatment offer based in addiction division, but very specialized in addictive behavior. So kind of convergence and kind of divergence. The second period, uh, important second period, is after the decision to include and before release of ICD-11 draft. And a lot of work has been done and we published a paper with Reed and, and colleagues uh, this year on the clinical evidence that can serve to understand and to decide whether you include these, uh, some mental health disorders, including gaming disorder, in addictive disorders or not. Ongoing projects uh, led by World Health Organization are development of screeners and diagnostic tools cross-culturally uh, uh, available and, uh, um, and uh, uh, applicable, and this is an ongoing work. And since the release of ICD-11, but how we can integrate ICD-11, this gold standard that allows you as a policymaker or as an advocate for having policies regarding uh, uh, to addictive behaviors. What then after having this gold standard? How to use it, how to implement it, and how to have to gather the adherence of the professionals to use it. So we conducted with WHO in Switzerland a field testing on what do care professionals, public health professionals in Switzerland think about ICD-11, including addictive behaviors, new category. They considered me in majority an added value and improvement regarding to, uh, in comparison to ICD-10 and uh, requiring, unsure that it, this require significant resources to move to ICD-11, but in major, in green, you can see that they were in favor, in Switzerland, from the field, they were in favor in having gaming and gambling disorder as very specifically added to the addictive disorders section in ICD-11. 
In the question of other, uh, other uh, addictive behaviors to be considered in ICD-11, they as well stated that the, the need is there from a clinical perspective, from a public health perspective in Switzerland to include more. Social networks, for example, are one of the disorders. They considered that there were public health relevance, for example, of adding the new category of gaming disorder within addictive disorders and addictive behaviors. And they were as well stating that this would help to communicate, including with patients and family members. They as well found the clinical relevance of gaming disorder and the spectrum from the use harmful hazardous and to the uh, gaming disorder, former gaming disorder. And with being it an independent clinical condition, not deriving from a mental health already existing condition. So if you are a policy maker, now you have the gold standard. If you are an advocate for having policies, you have a gold standard. What next? In Switzerland, for example, we are dealing with an issue which is how to have the implementation of ICD-11 for addictive behaviors really existing, living in the field. So one milestone in our country in March 2022 was the decision of Federal Office of Public Health to state that it is the gold standard in Switzerland to consider in terms of defining these disorders. Then this is not sufficient because afterwards you have the healthcare professionals. Will they use it? Will you have the sufficient data and the data covering all the country to decide then? To have this, so we have dealt in the federal expert group for cyber addiction since one year now, and we are going to release the document in, in end of this, of this month next uh, week, that we managed to consider what were the needs from the field of uh, considering having uh, a language, lexicon, a way of dealing with these disorders already ex pre-existing to ICD-11 and really considering ICD-11 as the gold standard from now. What's next? So capacity building, crucial issue to consider if you are a policy maker. To, for GD management, for example, what are the needs for implementation from Swiss professionals, for example, education has been stated as a major need and training methods, whether face-to-face -face or internet-based training. One additional issue in times of COVID is conversion with other mental health disorders, especially addictive disorders, to uh, have a continued treatment response even in times of crisis. And this is an article that you can read that we have published with King and R in four major centers all over the world specialized in gaming disorder treatment response. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. And now uh, we'll start our uh, discussion part of the event. And first, the, well, as you wish. Um, so the first, the microphone is to uh, Professor Luke Clark, uh, director of the Center for Gambling Research at the University of British Columbia. So Luke decided to stay there. I'll stay here. There we go. So, um, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to have this opportunity to air my, some of my thoughts on uh, this plenary session with you uh, while you in the audience um, get to formulate uh, some questions for the Q&A. And I'm not going to um, just kind of reiterate the, the, the comments that have already been made about how far uh, this field has come. Uh, instead, I, uh, I want to focus for a minute on what might be missing from some of the convergence that we've been talking about today. So I would say in, you know, in all cases of addiction, we have uh, a person and we have uh, a product that they are consuming to excess. 
And um, much of what we've heard about today um, is uh, you know, the focus on the person, personal vulnerabilities. So in the IPACE um, neuroscience model, the P there stands for person, um, and it's the person's brain that is being uh, imaged, for example. The products themselves are quite hard to study. Um, these are commercial games, commercial apps. Um, they can't be easily manipulated or maybe even accessed for research uh, purposes. And um, in neuroscience studies, you know, those products would need to be greatly simplified for neuroimaging. You can't just stick uh, a group of people in a brain scanner and have them open loot boxes in their favorite game. That's not how um, these kinds of studies work. So Mark um, and Silke um, both acknowledged the need for further understanding at the level of the products, but that is a far from trivial question. And um, a lot of academics have struggled with the idea that the internet itself might be um, addictive. So people often say, you know, it's surely what you're doing on the internet that counts. And by lumping together online gamblers and video gamers and people consuming online pornography and buying and shopping disorder, um, do we create unmanageable heterogeneity? So something that I've been um, working on myself with my colleague uh, Martin Zack um, we, uh, we've recently argued that many of these products actually share certain ingredients, and the most important of those is uh, reward uncertainty. So slot machines are, of course, the classic case of the variable ratio schedule, but uh, video games and social media apps harness the very same hooks as um, those gambling products. And then when we think about products like pornography and shopping, the reward uncertainty is dramatically modified and amplified by the online environment. So if you think about uh, YouTube or if you think about Amazon, um, you have infinite scrolls, you have recommended content and adverts, you have personalized recommendations that are based on your own prior preferences. And these features all introduce many layers of reward uncertainty. And in fact, the one condition that we've talked about today that in my mind doesn't obviously involve reward uncertainty is food or eating addiction. And I would suggest that that might be better considered as a substance addiction based on the, the sort of high degree of engineering of processed foods and perhaps not as a behavioral addiction if that, if that line is, is helpful. But returning to the sort of key point here, I would say it's too easy to think about the internet exclusively in terms of how we access um, these products. And I would encourage you to bear in mind that the internet is also um, changing the psychological and behavioral uh, nature of these products. Um, at that point, why don't I throw it open to the Q&A. Thank you, Luke. So then, any questions from or comments from the audience? Or any comments from you? Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, all of you for these uh, excellent presentations. I have the three issues, so be patient. The first one uh, is uh, there is a high comorbidity between ADHD and gaming. Uh, and there is one publication last month that gaming improved cognition. 
or cognitive functions. This is published in JAMA Pediatrics. And we have FDA approval for the first game to treat ADHD. And the best evidence for a treatment of gaming disorder is for ADHD medications. Are these kids having ADHD and they try to improve their attention by gaming? And if we treat ADHD, they will not have gaming? This is my first question. The second one about food addiction, and I don't know why they uh, include gaming and don't include food addiction. Although it, it has very high morbidity and mortality, the, the, the years lost because of food addiction and obesity is 10 to 15 years, which is very similar to drug addiction. I'm not aware about mortality and morbidity with gaming disorder. This is my second point. The third point and the last one uh, is, yes, there is uh, advantage to include these behaviors in classifications. So we'll have more research uh, to implement and to have planning for prevention treatment programs. But the major concern is to pathologizing normal behaviors and leisure activities. If somebody exercising too much, he has exercise addiction. Somebody dancing too much, this is dance addiction. Uh, studying hard or working hard, he has exercise or work addiction. How to balance between the advantage and disadvantage of including these behaviors in the uh, international classification? Thank you. I, I assume, Mark, you have some? Yeah. Um, so these are great points that were uh, raised. So I'll try to take the, the questions one by one and would encourage the other people on the panel to also um, provide thoughts. So um, ADHD um, and gaming, I think is a, an important topic, as is ADHD and behavioral addictions in general, because there tends to be high rates of co-occurrence uh, between ADHD and a range of uh, behavioral addictions. Um, some of the work that we have been undertaking uh, recently has been qualitative research into uh, the lived experiences of adults with ADHD. Um, as one of the um, medical students uh, who is working with me, um, she feels that the diagnostic criteria that currently exist for ADHD do not um, reflect uh, the lived experiences of adults, in that they more focus on children. Um, so uh, some of the uh, findings that have come out of that is this ability to um, have uh, periods of sustained attention that relate more to their level of interest in the behavior, more so than inattention. Um, so um, she has um, first authored an article um, that is communicating some of these findings. Um, that being said, I think that um, the overlap between ADHD and gaming um, could be uh, potentially uh, targeted, um, as is the case with um, behavioral addictions and other uh, disorders. So some of the data that we have published on and gambling disorder suggests that if one targets the co-occurring disorder in treatment, that problem gambling severity also improves. Data from our group, data from um, Eric Hollander's group, uh, uh, John Grant's group, and others. Um, so I think these are important to consider. Um, I'm not sure if other people want to chime in on that question first, or I'm happy to go through questions two and three on food addiction and uh, classification issues. I want just to say that uh, from my clinical perspective, though, since uh, more than 16 years now of experience, that we have as well people suffering comorbid with ADHD and as well with gaming disorder. Differentiating between gaming activity, gaming behavior, and dysfunctional pattern of gaming. And if gaming was the solution, for example, or the medication 
uh, to deal with ADHD, we wouldn't have people suffering from gaming disorder coming to us, come up with, with ADHD. It's a comfort for them, what they say to us from in our clinic in Switzerland. It's a comfort to them to have, for example, different screens opened at the same time, different windows opened at the same time in their screen, and they feel a sense of uh, more uh, being more self-competent and this is extremely rewarding to them and they continue sometimes gaming coping with these uh, uh, feeling low self-esteem and cognitive difficulties some studies uh, uh, show that a co there is a cognitive improvement related to gaming activity, but not with uh, gaming, for example, 20 hours a day or a lot and suffering from distress and from functional impairment, which are the two main uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, conditions to consider to, uh, to uh, treat, for example, a gaming disorder. Thank you. Yes, thank you for, for the questions, and I'm completely in agreement with my colleagues. And in our experience, it's the same. Although uh, patients um, uh, are in treatment, medical pharmacological treatment for the EHD, and probably in our case, we are uh, seeing more or less 20% of patients with gambling disorder, for instance, and ADHD, and more or less the same 30% of uh, patients with gaming disorder. But um, at the point that they have a very severe uh, gaming disorder or gambling disorder, they need uh, a specific treatment uh, to cope with uh, all problems caused uh, by the behavioral addiction. <laughs> So then on to question two, which was uh, with respect to food addiction um, and uh, with respect to its inclusion within nomenclature systems. And this is a topic that um, I and other colleagues um, have discussed. Um, and we have discussed advocating for the inclusion um, of a food addiction um, designation within uh, some of the uh, diagnostic manuals like the DSM. And my um, impression is that the DSM looks at the extent to which the inclusion of a diagnosis would um, be added clinical value to what already exists. And the inclusion of binge eating disorder in the DSM um, may um, limit the enthusiasm of further um, of the formal inclusion of a food addiction uh, category within the DSM. But that's my impression. Um, and we, there are, uh, myself and other colleagues are interested in uh, pursuing uh, this uh, further as, um, and this resonates with what Luke said in the uh, discussion, that um, a group of us believe that there are uh, a number of food, uh, foods and food products that um, have been generated that uh, are rewarding to people uh, and may be the basis of um, a uh, condition or concern uh, that uh, could be addictive in, in nature. So uh, I'll open it up to, to other people on the panel. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, in order to recognize uh, the existence of food addiction, we need uh, more studies about biomarkers and endophenotypes. Maybe it's uh, no, the, the, the solution to, to, to improve in this, in this area. Then, then uh, I'll move on to the uh, third question. Uh, which I, I think had to do with the potential for over, uh, patholo uh, over, patholo over pathologizing everyday behaviors uh, with respect to raising questions about 
dance addiction, work addiction, exercise addiction. I'll add fishing addiction since there have been articles on that as uh, well. Um, but this idea that uh, we try not to pathologize behaviors that people enjoy and are not uh, problematic for them is an important one to address and there's a, a, a literature where people have uh, looked at the pros and cons of the inclusion versus the exclusion of specific um, uh, disorders um, related to specific behaviors. And I think this is something that was taken into account in processes in the DSM, in the ICD, um, where uh, there is a clinical need for the conditions it was determined uh, for the disorders that are formally defined. And I would argue, as people have brought up on the, in their presentations, that this other specified disorders due to addictive behaviors category is an important stepping stone as we gather more information with other uh, behaviors and the extent to which there is a clinical need um, and the basis for uh, disorder. And so social network, uh, use, shopping, buying, or some other domains, uh, pornography use, whether that's, been, there's now been a clarification that that um, is considered within compulsive sexual behavior disorders in the ICD-11. Um, as of uh, 2022, they've added some clarification to this point. Uh, but there, there are a number of behaviors that have emerged um, over time, particularly with respect to internet use, that I think um, as clinicians, as um, the people who are involved in generating uh, the uh, manuals, the DSM, the ICD, as well as uh, policymakers and regulators, many people are playing catch up, um, clinicians as well. So it's an area that we need to grow and develop and understand better to try to help people. Th thank you, Mark. I think we have time yeah. just for one more one question, question and a quick answer. Okay, good. Thank you very much, uh, Salz, uh, Fernando Fernandez from Barcelona. I think it's a great topic what you have addressed in this symposium, trying to look at shared vulnerabilities among different behavioral addictions uh, or potential behavioral addictions. We have uh, in the literature and also in the research we are conducting, seeing, of course, many commonality between them. So probably it's lacking neurobiological markers, as also Susanna mentioned, but also the type of response they have is, might be also similar. With regard to food addiction, probably the, more than skipping food addiction from the uh, discussion from the DSM, probably we may need more research, as you know, Mark, uh, not centering in eating disorders, where it's a collineality between food addiction and eating disorders, but in populations that they have not an eating disorder and they have food addiction. So I, I agree with the need for, for more research and um, we, since it's been brought up again, uh, we are generating the second edition of the Oxford Handbook on Food Addiction, which should be coming out uh, probably in the next year or so. So uh, we agree, I, I agree with um, the point being raised about the need for more research. Thank you very much, uh, Fernando and everyone. And just the good news, I mean, the bad news is that we have to finish now. The good news is that there, as I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, there is there's gonna be a big debate uh, tomorrow at 6.30 in the afternoon in the same room here uh, on very similar topics. So we can kind of continue this uh, discussion uh, tomorrow. And as I also mentioned, those who are open for a whole conference uh, designated to the issue of uh, behavior addictions, you are welcome to register to the uh, eighth uh, international conference on behavior addiction, which will be held in uh, Incheon, South Korea, uh, next year uh, in August. Uh, so thank you very much again for, for being here with us this afternoon and uh, wishing you uh, also a further nice uh, conference and hope to see you tomorrow uh, again. Thank you very much uh, for all being here and also for the speakers. Thank you.